Well, it's uh, again a, a privilege, and uh, we're so blessed in our congregation uh, with uh, retired pastors. Not that pastors are the only ones that can preach the word, but uh, they've had the opportunity over the years, and uh, so it gives opportunity for that. Um, when Paul opened his letters and began to to teach and to write uh, to the churches that he wrote to, uh, he often brought in those opening words, words of encouragement and guidance. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to look at uh, two of Paul's letters and the opening verses in them. Uh, today I will uh, take us to 1 Thessalonians, and next week Pastor Ted will bring us to 1 Corinthians. And as we do this, we want to listen to what the Lord ha had to say to the believers then, but also what he has to say to us. And our overriding theme for these two weeks is listening to God in difficult times. Listening to God in difficult times. And he will speak. And some of what we hear will lift our hearts up to see who he is. And some of what we hear will teach us who we are in Christ. And so uh, let's look at these introductions. And sort of another part of the theme aspect, uh, we've been doing a bit of a study in, for, in Revelation. And I love the words in the to those churches, uh, the first, in the seven churches, he, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to them. Let him hear what the Spirit says. So that's my prayer this morning, and I trust it's your prayer as uh, we turn to, to God's Word. So let's turn to 1 Thessalonians and... We'll read the, the first chapter, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly remembering, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. For you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all, believe, all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith uh, in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us, the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's just commit the word of God in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. And we pray, Lord, that as we listen 
and as you speak, that we would hear. Speak to us, Father. Uh, open your word to our hearts and our lives, and, and may we with joy want to follow you in all ways. And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I say, this is uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. He uh, founded the church. If you want to flip for a moment to Acts 17, he founded the church, and it's re recorded back then uh, in ver Acts 17. It says, and Paul went in, this is to Thessalonica, and was, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great number, a uh, great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So he it was just three weeks, and God worked, and the church was founded and established there. But then, right out of the gate, comes persecution and uh, difficulty. For if you read on in Acts 17, you see that. The Jews were jealous, it says, and taking some wicked men of the ramble, rabble, I'm not sure what the rabble is, but these guys were <laughs> sitting around doing nothing, I guess, and they were easy to motivate to say things and do things, and they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. And, and so they attacked them and the people, uh, and down in verse 8, it says the people and city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security for Jason and the rest, they let them go. And then immediately the brothers sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Three weeks in a, in a town. And God worked in, in a mighty way. And so we'll see this reflected as we look into this uh, first chapter. Um, the scholars who, who sort of try to pin the date of this say it probably was in the spring of 50 A.D. So here we are in the spring of 2022 hearing uh, the words of Paul to, yes, to that church, to our church, and to us. And so we do want to listen and, and hear uh, what God has to say. And I trust it'll, it'll encourage your heart and cause you to want to follow him with a greater vigor our theme is that we as believers must listen to what he has to say to us. So as I was reading it and listening and saying, Lord, what do you have to say? Uh, the first part that I, I saw there was the importance of giving thanks and of prayer. Listen again to what Paul writes. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus. Right away you hear the importance of prayer and of thanksgiving. Paul was a man of prayer, and so must we be people of prayer. Uh, and I know we are a praying church. I, I've come to see that and understand that. And in our care groups, I know that uh, 
there's prayer goes on when they meet. I know that now a, a new prayer group has started uh, before service. And, of course, during the service, a pastor often leads us in prayer. And then I know in the uh, people in their individual devotional life, as they walk with the Lord, they, they try to remember the prayer requests and the needs of our congregation and, and of others. So I don't know, how's your prayer life? When do you pray? Do you have a special time every day uh, or just as throughout the day spend time in prayer? And if we are to be a thankful and prayerful follower, we need to listen to some of the aspects of uh, this as we look at these verses. He says, we give thanks always. Our, the Thanksgiving and the prayers were, were continual. They, Paul didn't just stop. He didn't just have a special day or special time, but he, he prayed often. And, and so must we. Uh, he was concerned for his relationship because he was only with them a short time. And, and so it was important that he maintain this connection uh, through prayer and through thanksgiving. And so here is words again. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly. We're mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father. Paul assures them that they are not forgotten, and he regularly and continually remembers them in prayer. Uh, how do you feel when you somebody... or? May, maybe hasn't happened to you for a while, comes up to you and says, hey, I'm praying for you. Or, hey, I, I give thanks for you. You're, I appreciate you. And say words like that. Um, it, it can lift us up. And, and so we need to, to do that. That our, our prayers are continual and regular, and they're expressed. Um, Paul writes to them out of a relationship. He was torn away in such a short time, and yet he maintained that relationship through prayer and through writing, and he gives thanks for, for them. Remember what Paul says in Philippians. He says, In everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's so that thanksgiving and prayer go together. We give thanks and we pray. We pray and we give thanks. And uh, care for people that way. But he expresses it. He doesn't keep it a secret. It's not a, it's not a big secret that Paul prays for them. In fact, he, he lets them know. Um, he wants them to be encouraged. Uh, when I was, we were missionaries and traveling around, um, it meant a lot to us to know that people were praying. Now, sometimes when you're out in the field or out ministering, uh, you had a sense, boy, what we just went through, boy, somebody was praying. God, God worked. God answered. And I, I remember visiting this one uh, church and a fellow comes up to me and he goes, I know you. I know you. I go, okay. <laughs> he says, you're on my fridge. <laughs> and I guess the, they had taken their, our prayer card and had uh, put it up on their fridge so that they would remember to pray for us, and that they did often at mealtimes and would pray for us along with other missionaries. And it means a lot to have it expressed as well as, of course, it's important to do it to not just say it. You know, sometimes 
we can say, well, I'll pray for you. And then we go, whoops, did I pray for them? Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's good to write it down. It's good to do it right away. Sometimes if I say that to somebody, I'll pray for you as I'm walking away and turning, I go, Lord, be with them. And, you know, so, that, so get, get it in right away and then hopefully then remember it as the days go on and have other opportunities. And so let's be people of prayer and let's not be afraid to express it to one another. It encourages you encourages each other, whether you do it in writing, a little note, whether you do it verbally, uh, however you do it. Um, and Paul, when he gave thanks and uh, prayed for them, he lists some areas just in case they weren't sure what he would be praying about. You know, sometimes that can be scary. I'm praying for you. Okay. What do I need prayer for? <laughs> well, he lists some things that he's praying for them on. He, he says, I, I pray for your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Here is a church that is, is suffering. It's in affliction. Right away, persecution had started, and it was continuing. And so here... Their work comes out of a deep faith and trust in God, and so he, he prays for that and gives thanks for that. And they go the extra mile and sacrifice out of love for God and for others. It was a labor prompted by love. And they didn't quit. Sometimes you don't know when to stop praying for somebody. I don't know if you've ever had a prayer list and go, oh, do they still need prayer? Huh? Uh, but you, you keep on praying for them until you know either an answer or the situation has changed. Uh, and they don't quit. or They know that God has won the victory and that they as believers share in that victory. So in the church and in your Christian walk, do you keep on working at, and trusting in, in him? Are you willing to hang in there even when things don't go your way or are difficult? And when you see the church and people alive in their faith, does it encourage you? It did Paul. He, he said, I see in you uh, this faithful walk. Think of people you know and give thanks for them and pray for them. And... Uh, you may have regular ones that you pray for, but sometimes, and we'll get a, we're getting that directory out someday soon. You may even want to use our church directory uh, to pray for different ones in the, in the congregation and remember them and give thanks for them. And so he's thankful. He's pray, prayerful. But he's also thrilled because... They have come to know Christ. There's the reality of their salvation. Uh, listen to the next set of verses as Paul goes on to talk about their salvation. He says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Did you catch all those words? Brothers, loved by God and chosen by him. A lady was out walking her two big dogs and uh, a passerby stopped her on, on the way and, and said, oh, those are big dogs, nice dogs. Um, does this happen to you, Ted? Do people stop you when you're walking your dogs? Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what are their names? Oh, this is Timex and Rolex. Well, those are strange names, the person said. He said, oh, no, they're watchdogs. <laughs> well, 
Sometimes the label points you to what the truth is, who they are. And the labels he uses here point to who we are in Christ. Can you think of a time that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And so now Paul says, you are brothers and sisters together. You're loved by God. You're chosen by him. The, the word brothers points to the fact that we're in relationship with one another in the family of God. Uh, that when we come to know Jesus, it says, John writes, 1 John 1, 12, but to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, that we are children of God and family uh, so together. He often, we often use that expression around here, you know, that we're family in Christ. And that's a very good biblical label, truth. Uh, but he then goes on to say that they're loved by God. Now, when you read that truth, you can read it over and over, and, oh, yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that, I know that. For God so loved the world. You remember that, guys? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Yeah. And it's like, but it ought to move us deeply. We ought to be constantly amazed at his great love for us. And in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, Paul prays that as believers they will understand and they will be constantly amazed and gripped by the love of God. That the believers would, as it says, have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so we, when we hear loved by God, don't let it just pass over. Let it hit and land and realize what a wonderful, deep, amazing truth. It's real. It's personal. We're coming up to Easter season. Well, some would say we're already in the midst of Easter season. Uh, but soon we will be coming to uh, talk about Christ going to the cross, paying the price for us. And again, we will stand there at the foot of the cross and we will be amazed at his great love for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, it says. And so, Paul's use of these labels or terms that you are brothers, that you are loved by God, and that he has chosen you. The whole realm of choosing an election ought to cause us to be thankful and amazed at his grace. He doesn't describe the how, uh, but the certainty of it. There was evidence of the fact that they were chosen. And so hear what the evidence was. He says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. They heard the word. They saw the power of God, both in his uh, speaking, and it, it doesn't say it specifically, but he, as he interacted with them, he, uh, as the apostles went around, they did miraculous things and healed people and did uh, special things. So they, in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, 
the Spirit of God worked deep into their lives so that even in just three uh, weeks, many people came to know Christ. Many people accepted Him um, with full conviction. It was a, a convicting, it, it wasn't just mental assent, but as the Word of God does, it penetrates deep into the heart and soul, and they were deeply convicted, so much so that they repented. They turned from sin and turned to God in Christ and accepted Him. For by grace have you been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. So do you have that assurance this morning? Do you have that uh, assurance that you are his, that you are a follower of Christ, that you know him, uh, that you are his child? And can you point to, to your life where you've turned from sin and turned to Christ and uh, uh, accepted him? John 5:24. It says, truly, truly, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in me and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. And he has gone from judgment and he's passed from death to life. The wages of sin is death, the scripture says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So give thanks that you are his child and that you have come to know him and that these labels apply to you. And let's live as brothers and sisters in Christ. A new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you so you will love one another. I'm going to tell a fictitious story to illustrate uh, our love for one another. It's not a true story. Um, the fictitious story is told of a man who went to heaven. And when he, he got to heaven, he was so amazed and grateful but then he said, uh, Peter, who was directing things then, um, I, could I go to hell to see, uh, just, I mean, this is wonderful, but I, could I go to hell to just see the difference, you know, just a you know, stronger comparison, if you like? Um, so Peter took him to hell. And he found himself in a room with a table loaded with food, all kinds of food. You know, pastors should never do that, talk about food when it's before lunch. But anyway, the table was loaded with food. And, uh, and yet the people sitting around it were starving. They were obviously emancipated, uh, then, what's the word? Uh, they, they were in need. They were suffering. And, uh, and so the man said to Peter, why, why are these people starving? He said, well, this is hell, remember. And we give them uh, four-foot chopsticks to eat with. Each one is given a two four, four foot chopsticks to eat with. And they can't get the food with these long chopsticks from the table to their mouth. And so here's all this food, but they're starving. The man thanked, and can we go back? And uh, so they went back to heaven. And they got to heaven, and there the man saw the table loaded with food. And 
people sitting around and they were well fed and obviously ha had enough and and so he said well that's yeah i can see the difference wow yeah it's huge uh well how do you eat in heaven oh, oh we give everybody four foot chopsticks to eat with what how could that be he, peter smiled and said well it's simple in heaven, we feed each other. And so the, the concept is that as believers, we are loved by God and we are to love one another and to care for one another and to show that love where we can. And I'm... Uh, thankful and I often hear of how when people are, are sick or have difficulty or go through issues, uh, the congregation rallies to support and to, to encourage them. Remember, that was a fictitious story. But the point is that as Christians, we love one another. Um, and this led Paul to another uh, note of thanks. As, and they became imitators of us, he said, and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy in the Holy Spirit. Their message brought, didn't bring an easy life, but it brought a joyful life, a real life. Uh, they had been saved by God through grace in Christ. To follow Jesus doesn't mean that we won't in, endure rejection uh, or suffering, but that we will uh, know the joy that he brings. Remember the fruit of the Spirit? That's always a good encouragement to read the fruit of the Spirit, but begins by the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 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 peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, so he rejoices over them that they have been, uh, not that they were freed from difficulties, because even while he was there, they, they suffered, but that he encouraged them that uh, there's joy in knowing Jesus. For they were followers of Jesus and of the apostles. Jesus wrote, I, I have said this in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so they became an example to others. And so you became an example, verse 7, uh, to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They became an example. Can you think of those that have modeled the Christian life for you? Can you think of those that have demonstrated what it is to follow Christ, even amid difficulties, and to know his presence uh, and power in their lives. Um, I know God has brought over the years people in my life, um, even some among you, <laughs> that I look at your life and I say, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you for their faith and their trust in you and their, their walk with you. And we pray that our lives, too, will be examples. Well, if you're, as we still listen through this opening, these opening verses, he's mentioned thanksgiving and prayer. He's mentioned their salvation, this knowing the joy of knowing Jesus and spending time with him in prayer. And now he, he ends by pointing to their example the expansion of their witness and example as they served Jesus 
awaiting his return. Uh, for not only, verse 8, not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. He rejoices because they modeled the Christian life and they passed it on and let their message, uh, uh, the message of Christ ring out from them. It's our desire always to not just be a church gathered, but a church scattered. That we not only pray here, but we pray for those serving uh, in other places as well. And, and we desire that in our context, whether it be school, whether it be work, whether it be in our neighborhoods, that people w would sense something different in us and that it would uh, shine forth. Now here, he actually says the message rang out from them. It sounded out is the translation. Uh, the word of the Lord sounded forth you. So the word is actually trumpeted. Uh, Adam, do you play the trumpet? A little bit. Uh, the word trumpeted out from the, the people there in Thessalonica so that those who met them, who heard, heard of them, uh, understood that there had been an amazing transformation. They were the talk. Remember, if you, I sometimes jokingly call it the book of maps. I don't know if you have one in, the, in your, it's not a real book either, <laughs> but it's in many Bibles, there's the, the map at the back that show you the times then. Um, Thessalonica was on an east-west road right at a seaport. And so people came and went and they traveled through and uh, they heard of what had happened to the Thessalonians. Thessalonians, and it moved them, it spoke to them, and the word spread. The word trumpeted out from them. They were on this main road. And so they became a testimony. And that's why in verse 9 he says, they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception they had, how the apostles had been received, uh, how they, they had come to faith, how they would turned from idols to a true and living God. That's what repentance is, turning from sin and turning to, to God. Uh, and that's what they had done. And, and the people could see it. They could see the difference. Uh, we were missionaries in Indonesia, and when I would go into a village, there would be often, most villages had an idol area where they had just, they were uh, wooden stakes where they'd carved a bit of an image of a man, a person, uh, on it. And they would make sacrifices and do things there. Or you'd walk by a rice field, and out in the middle of the rice field, you'd see either kind of a little shack-type building where they were praying to the gods of the rice field to protect and give them a good harvest. But when they came to Christ, they turned from doing that to trusting God, to trusting the Lord Jesus. As you see, it was a power struggle. Who is greater? And they had to come to the point where they came to know Jesus and then turned from that and then trusted in him. And I still, you know... 
I remember one of the last trips to a village uh, uh, that I went to, uh, the uh, head of the village, he had been resisting a, a long time or, or had been coming to services but not really fully committed. And then he said, he came to me, he was so excited. He said, I planted my rice field and I didn't sacrifice. I'm trusting Jesus. And, and, and it just shows that that turning from and turning to Christ. But how does that look in, in our world? We don't have little idol centers, although you, you can visit homes and people of certain faiths might have uh, idol centers in their home. Um, but generally we don't see that and generally we don't see um, people worshiping idols. So what is it? It's turning from a lifestyle, a hard attitude, a false worship of any kind and turning to Christ, accepting him as Savior, as Lord, and walking with him every, every day. I have a brother-in-law, and he, they're going to be visiting my sister's husband. Um, he has a, a unique job. He is, I think it's labeled, uh, assembly line engineer. Now, every year they come out with new cars or modified cars or, or things change. And so what happens on the assembly line? Like you have to, an assembly line, what really matters? What goes in at the beginning? What's in the middle? And what comes out at the end? Well, ultimately, it's what comes out at the end. Because that's, so what do you do if all of a sudden you're going to change the shape of the vehicle or you're going to add electric, if <laughs> that's what we're doing now a lot, um, so that the final product is different, comes out different. Well, somebody needs to figure out how you, excuse me, and cut here, cut there, put on a piece, so they take the piece and flip it this way and drooped it that way. And he's tried to explain it to me, and as you can see, I probably really haven't got it, except that I get the general concept is that in the end of the day, it's what comes out that counts. And what Paul describes here is this is what they report. This is what comes out. They themselves report the kind of reception we had among you, how they received the uh, missionaries and speakers, and how you turned from God to turned to sorry turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait. To wait for the return of his son, the Lord Jesus. We don't often talk about it, but someday Jesus is coming back. He's in heaven right now, and we have a relationship with him, and we walk with him in that way, and the Spirit of God is in our lives. But the day will come that Christ will return. And in the meantime, we are to be walking with him and living for him and listening to him. Because you see, all this listening I've been talking about is not that sort of passive listening, uh-huh, 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 kind of what us husbands get guilty of <laughs> with our wives, yeah, 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 yeah. Did you hear what I said? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, well, let's not go there. But um, here it is that we need to have that active listening. James says it good. 
He says, be doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving yourself. That we are to have an act of listening. We're to have an act of waiting. And we're to live for him every day. Does that describe your life? Have you uh, committed yourself to, to following him with your whole heart? Do you know him as Savior and Lord? Uh, if you're here and you've never uh, come to Christ by faith, I, I would encourage you to turn from those things that are capturing you now and turn and receive Jesus as Savior. And if you've never come to him, do it today. Today is the day of salvation. That was the, one of the verses that uh, led me to accept Christ. Because I had always said, I was in my teens, but I'd say, oh, later, when I'm a little older, when, I, when it might not cost me so much, uh, I'll accept Jesus. And the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. Turn to him, accept Jesus, and walk with him your whole life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these opening words. Paul has so much more to say to the church then and to us. And, and you spoke to us through these opening words. Lord, we pray that each one will know that reality, that they are brothers and sisters, that they are chosen, that they are loved by God. Thank you, Lord. Continue to be our guide and may our witness sound forth to others that they would hear and believe. And so we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.